Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome back to the New Books Network. I'm Keith Kruger, one of the hosts on the Intellectual History Channel. And today, it's a real honor to be joined once again by Michael Walzer, Professor Emeritus of Social Science from 1980 to 2007 at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. A professor at both Princeton and Harvard, and for more than 30 years he served as co-editor of Dissent, and for nearly as long as a contributing editor for the New Republic. As a professor, author, editor, and lecturer, Michael Walzer needs no introduction as one of America's foremost political thinkers, addressing a broad range of topics in political theory and moral philosophy. His empathetic and thoughtful approach allowed for the kind of interdisciplinary cross-pollination that the Institute fosters, interacting with notable scholars such as anthropologist Clifford Gertz, the political economist A.O. Hirschman, the philosopher Stuart Hampshire, and the libertarian political theorist Robert Nozick, with whom he co-taught a course titled Capitalism and Socialism. A former student, the Washington Post columnist, Brookings Senior Fellow, and policy professor E.J. Dion once said, It was one of the best courses he ever took, adding, it was Michael Walzer who very much shaped my view. A short list of Professor Walzer's book titles include Just and Unjust Wars, Spheres of Justice, A Defense of Pluralism and Equality, The Company of Critics, Thick and Thin, Moral Argument at Home and Abroad, On Toleration, Politics and Passion, The Jewish Political Tradition, The Paradox of Liberation, Secular Revolutions and Religious Counter-Revolutions, A Foreign Policy for the Left, as well as a published conversation with the political theorist Astrid von Busekist, titled Justice is Steady Work, A Conversation on Political Theory, uh, published by Polity Press in 2020. His articles and interviews have appeared frequently in the world's foremost newspapers and journals, and when we last spoke, The focus was primarily on his 2018, A Foreign Policy for the Left. But today, we want to turn our attention primarily to his latest, The Struggle for a Decent Politics, on liberal as an adjective, published last month by Yale University Press. Professor Walzer, Michael, appreciate you taking the time to talk with us again. Let me start uh, with the dedication of the latest book, where you wrote, For J.B.W., with whom I have been sheltering in places for more than 60 years. I bring this up in part because you mentioned recently you were moving away from Princeton after some 40 years. That's a lot of sheltering in one place. It's also an apt term, especially during the pandemic. And moving, as everyone knows, involves a bit of stress, no matter how smooth the transition How did you both decide on the move then, and and how's it going? We aren't settled in yet. We are still in the process of trying to to sell our house and get rid of thousands of of books that won't fit into our New York apartment and deal with all the papers accumulated in in many, many, many years of, uh, of shared academic life. We're moving because... Our children and our grandchildren all live in the city, and it's time at our age, uh, we're both 87, it's time for us to be close to them. Sure it is. Since we started down this um, more personal path, let me ask you this now. You have a chapter on liberal feminists, and in it you describe your sheltering partner as a Bolshevik feminist. It's an enduring and humorous description, uh, given the book's approach, but more so because, as you point out, at the time, you two were younger, and there were still many vestiges of a more chivalrous era. Well, um, I call her a Bolshevik feminist because way back in the 1950s, when we were, as they say, dating, um, she would never let me hold the door open for her or 
or help her on with her coat or uh, pay for a, a movie ticket. Uh, she was already quite adamant on the uh, equality of, um, of men and women. But actually, the inspiration for that chapter, the insistence that I write that chapter, came from my sister. And that chapter has been read and reread and commented on by every one of my female relatives, I think most importantly by my granddaughter. It was uh, for an elderly man to write about issues of feminism today. Well, it's, it's a minefield, and I needed a lot of help. Thanks for sharing that, Michael. I'm sure the source of your inspiration goes without saying among family, friends, and colleagues. Clearly, though, your writing has international appeal. Your conversation with political theorist Astrid von Busekist at Sciences Po in Paris was originally published in French, and the English version came out in 2020 as Justice's Steady Work, a conversation on political theory. In the introduction, Professor Busicus wrote, a good political philosopher is a person who belongs in the world, or more precisely, in their world, a world of their fellows. In that sense, they do an inside job, social critique, to be relevant, and to be connected, as Walzer says, must be performed from the inside out. Its object is one's own society. It is made stronger by its ties to the history of shared meanings, the way it exists here and now. The social critic must always be able to assume the standpoint from which they speak. This point is key to understanding Michael Walzer's work. It gives intelligibility to his research, clarifies his contribution to public debate, and characterizes the man. Astrid's reference uh, to the relevance of social commentary as an inside job on one's own culture requires, as she wrote, the critic to be able to assume the standpoint from which they speak. Can you build on her point that this is key to understanding you and your work over the years? Uh, it's, a, it's a lovely description, and I, I really hope I have at least sometimes lived up to it. I, I've never believed that the, the social critic or the public intellectual uh, should be somebody who stands on a on a mountaintop and and wags his finger at the the people down down below. A social critic is a member of the society that he criticizes, and presumably he is committed. He should be committed to the well-being of that society. And so his criticism has to be addressed to his fellow citizens, and it has to be expressed in a, in a language that's familiar to them. He is calling upon his fellow citizens to live up to their own highest aspirations and, and deepest values. And all my books, even those that look like political theory, all of them are political arguments addressed to my own contemporaries, and I hope always in a language that is accessible and meaningful uh, to them. Well put, Michael. The struggle for a decent politics on liberal as an adjective. In your preface, you point out this book is not a book about or an explication of political theory. Uh, rather, this is an informal argument based on a lifetime of reading. I I want to return to the preface, but for now, it seems important to point out how the organization of the book serves as a preview for your thoughts and considerations under particular labels. Your first chapter explains the underlying premise at work appropriately titled uh, Why the Adjective. The book then organizes the adjective-noun pairings, starting with chapter two, liberal Democrats, liberal socialists, chapter three, followed by liberal nationalists and internationalists, the fourth chapter, 
liberal communitarians, the fifth chapter, liberal feminists, chapter six, and chapter seven is titled liberal professors and intellectuals. Chapter eight is liberal Jews, ending with your ninth and last chapter, who is and who isn't. In the first chapter, Why the Adjective, you point out the struggle for a decent politics is an attempt to answer the question, what does liberal morality have to do with politics? This is a context-setting chapter, I think. Listeners will be interested in hearing about, not only because of what the adjective accomplishes, but also in the way you articulate the liberal sensibility. How do you characterize this sensibility as well as its illiberal counterpart? The argument of the book is precisely that um, that liberal signifies a certain morality, a certain psychology, a certain, as you say, sensibility. Uh, this is not a book about liberalism, which I don't believe right now is a coherent ideology. So I, I am interested in what the adjective does to all the nouns that you just uh, just listed. And I think if I were to characterize the sensibility, it is um, well, my favorite actress, Lauren Bacall, once said, a liberal is someone who doesn't have a small mind. Um, so the um, the adjective liberal signifies a certain generosity of um, a certain sense of tolerance for ambiguity, a certain willingness to join arguments that you don't absolutely have to win, um, a certain acceptance of um, different uh, ideologies, different religions, um, different kinds of, uh, of of human beings and an illiberal sensibility exemplified today all over the world is one precisely that rejects is intolerant of ambiguity rejects the um the civil rights the human rights of um the others whoever the others are re rejects the um the constraints of human rights as in um orban's notion of an illiberal democracy which is precisely a, a major majoritarian rule unconstrained by any acceptance of the civil liberties or the human rights of um minorities liberal is supposed to do a certain kind of work it doesn't provide the deep commitment the deep commitment is to democracy or socialism or nationalism or community or the profession of teaching or judaism but that deep commitment is qualified by the adjective liberal which imposes a certain kind of magnanimity and pluralism on the um on the deeper commitment thanks michael well stepping back for a moment uh, to the preface you point out this book is about and i quote the best kind of politics not a program more a hope described and defended in a way inspired by two books which books are they and uh why are they significant here they were very important to me um both because they uh they reflect upon my own deepest commitments one book is by the Italian anti-fascist intellectual from the 1920s and 30s, Carlo Roselli. He was the leader of the of the major non-communist resistance to Mussolini, imprisoned by Mussolini, escaped to Paris, where he continued uh, anti-fascist uh, activity. He was assassinated in 1937, murdered by two thugs sent uh, to France by uh, by Mussolini. Two years before that, he published a book called Liberal Socialism, which is an account of, of a kind of social democracy that's an alternative to the communist resistance to uh, Italian fascism. And the other book is by a friend of mine in, in Israel, Yael Tamir, who wrote a doctoral dissertation with Isaiah Berlin, the quintessential liberal, uh, at Oxford years ago, and that was published as a book called Liberal Nationalism, 
And um, Tamir is writes generally about what liberal nationalism means, but she is also expressing her own liberal Zionism. Uh, and those those two books by people I greatly admire were very influential in getting me started thinking about what is the adjective doing in phrases like liberal socialism or liberal nationalism. What is the work of um, of the adjective? And the book is really um, an effort to figure that out. That's some good background. Your description of your uh, latest book, More a Hope, reminded me of a collection of essays that the late uh, Richard Rorty published under the title Philosophy and Social Hope. Uh, in his introduction, he pushes back on the charge of relativism and reframes his own adherence to John Dewey. So Rorty argues that both history and biology are at odds with Kant's view of human beings and that both subjects teach us that the development of societies ruled by laws rather than men was, in his words, a slow, late, fragile, contingent, evolutionary achievement. Rorty then points out that recently Michael Walzer a political philosopher best known for his earlier work, Spheres of Justice, has come to Hegel's and Dewey's defense. In his more recent book, Thick and Thin, Walzer argues we should not think of the customs and institutions of particular societies as accidental accretions around a common core of universal moral rationality the transcultural moral law. Rather, we should think of the thick set of customs and institutions as prior and as what commands more allegiance. Does your earlier work that Rorty was referring to connect or dovetail with your moral sensibility over the struggle for a decent politics to what extent would you say being a liberal Jew informs your political theorizing and moral critiques apart from your positions on Israel? I was a good friend of, of, of Rorty during his years in Princeton. We, we often met and talked uh, together, and I am certainly uh, influenced by his own um, pragmatism, though I think... Uh, <laughs> I, I have I have not been much influenced by um, by Hegel, uh, even if um, I have sometimes been influenced by followers of Hegel, like uh, perhaps Rorty thought himself uh, to be. I do believe in the thick moral culture um, of a particular people um, does precede universal morality. Um, universal morality is a kind of what Rawls calls the overlying, overlapping consensus. When people who have lived uh, a culture find themselves required to interact with other cultures, with people traveling, buying and selling, uh, fleeing, wherever, when they feel themselves compelled to interact, that is when we get the development of the expression of a common uh, universal of morality that has to cross all the the boundaries. So yes, I believe I do believe, as you said, um, that thick morality precedes the the universal morality. But um, like Rorty, I'm not a a relativist. I do think the universal morality has power over all of us. Uh, now, um, the experience of of um, growing up as a as a Jew in New York. Uh, in the during World War II, um, that has certainly been a, a definitive experience for for me, and it is expressed at many points in the new book, in all my books. World War II for a Jewish kid in New York was so obviously a just war, the war against Nazism, a necessary war. It constituted a kind of immunization against pacifism. And the experience of living um, in a democratic society as a minority alongside anti-Semites, but also alongside people generally, genuinely committed to human rights, the human rights of, of everyone. Um, that experience has been very, very important in shaping my own 
attitudes toward minorities, toward the the meaning of of, of democratic politics, the meaning of part of citizenship. All of that has been very much shaped by my experience as an American Jew. And, and a number of, of my um, critics, some of my biographers, have recognized that at every point in my work. Well, in that piece, uh, Rorty also wrote that someone who adopts the anti-Kantian stance common to Hegel, Dewey, and Walzer is asked to defend the thick morality of the society with which she identifies herself and will not uh, be able to do so by talking about the rationality of her moral views. Do you agree with Rorty on this and and being grouped with Hegel and Dewey as anti-Kantians? Pretty heavy company, however you put it. Yes, a comic series. Um, I don't belong <laughs> in it. I, I hold and have defended the views attributed to me by uh, by Rorty, but I don't come to them through the work of Hegel and Dewey. Um, I don't think of myself as a philosopher, at least not in the in any um, uh, professional sense. And I think most philosophers don't think of me as a philosopher. But I do hold those views, and I've come upon them in my own uh, in my own fashion through my own uh, experience. Yes, I. Uh, you, you know, there is a there is a um, a Jewish joke, a guy about a a son who comes to visit his parents, and he's dressed like a like a a, a sailor uh, or or a yachtsman because he's just bought a yacht, and this is his uh, uniform. And his mother looks at him and says, um, "So you're a, you're a captain by by my father, by your father, you're a captain. By me, you're a captain." But by the captains, are you a captain? So I think if you consult the philosophers, they will tell you that I don't belong in the company of Hegel and Dewey. Uh, I'm not sure everyone would agree with that assessment, but um, let, let's move on to your uh, second chapter, which covers uh, liberal Democrats. That's the title. You open uh, describing the process of progressive inclusion as working out of democracy itself and point out, as with freedom, eternal struggle is the price of democracy. You go on to note that racism, followed by the inequalities of class and gender, are America's particular pathologies. And you note, historically, democracy has been very undemocratic. I, I want to start with your focus on the question, who makes up the majority? That is, who are counted as the people? Can you talk about thinking, or your thinking, I should say, with regard to the demos and the agents of democratization in the U.S.? Well, the demos should include all of the citizens of the society, and any immigrants should be on the road to uh, citizenship. So um, I believe that democracy implies a radical inclusiveness. Government by the governed means all of the governed. It means that no one experiences government as a tyrannical force from the from the outside. Now that's not a description of any actual of any of the regimes that we call democratic, beginning with ancient Athens. So the history of democracy is a history of the the storming of the citadel of citizenship by all of the outsiders, the slaves, the proletarians, women, uh, Jews, blacks, all, uh, new immigrants. It's a long story of a whole series of, of people, groups of people demanding inclusion, demanding equal citizenship. And that's, that is democratic history. Many of the battles that have been fought and won have the victories have turned out to be partial and incomplete, and the battles have to be fought again, as in Reconstruction after the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement and Black Lives Matter. It's an ongoing, an ongoing struggle, and the same thing can be said about class and gender. It's not that all the victories are are temporary. Some of them seem to be sustained, but they continue. They are incomplete, and the battles continue. 
and democratic politics, in my view, left politics, is simply the, the, the story of the demand for equality. Thanks, Michael. Can you share also with listeners your explanation of populism and your use of the term maximal leader in that chapter? You write about the typology of reward, repression, and constitution rigging, as well as the treatment of journalists and organized opposition, seems important and relevant these days. And how do you attribute the attraction, as you mentioned just now, Hungary's Viktor Orban, the illiberal Democrat, to summon the Republican Party? Well, first, we needed a definition of of, of populism, and it is the um... It is a kind of majoritarian rule without um, any constraints. This unrestrained majority tends to find a personal representative, and he is the maximal leader. The phrase comes from Latin American populism, um, but you can also think of um, of Nazism. The, the, the maximal leader claims to embody the general will. He claims to represent the people with a capital P. And he claims the right to suppress um, opposition in the name of democracy, majoritarian democracy. We see that um, in a country like Hungary. We see tendencies toward that in Poland and very recently in Israel. Uh, Trumpism is a tendency. It's not the same thing, but it is a tendency in that direction. Uh, with Trump doing a good imitation of um, of a maximal leader, I alone can can save you, and that is uh, that is a, a politics that has to be described as um, it is a, a democratic version, ultra democratic majoritarian version of the end of democracy, because democracy the the rule of the governed requires the ability of the governed to criticize the government and to organize political parties and social movements for a purpose, even the purpose of changing the government. So, so this is a version of democracy that is the end of democracy. Uh, why it has appeal, um, I think that has a lot to do with, in the United States, a lot to do with the, the sharp increase in inequality in the United States over the last um, decades. The sense of uh, many, many Americans, workers, victims of globalization, of uh, industrial decline, um, the sense of many uh, Americans that they have been left behind, that the quote unquote elites um, don't care about them, are actually working to um, to replace them as uh, the, uh, the, the effective citizens of this, of this country. I think inequality has a lot to do with it and um, ideological racism, white nationalism. I don't wanna say it's entirely the product of economic inequality, but I think that is an important uh, part of it. And I think the, um, the abandonment of social democratic and um, American liberal politicians, the abandonment of the old working class is one of the causes of Trumpism. Um, I can tell a story, that my own story of two cities. I grew up in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, which was in the 40s and 50s and 60s, a steel town, Bethlehem Steel. And it was, after the Union came in 41, it was a democratic town. And then the steel industry disappeared. The Union collapsed. The, the Democratic Congress people could not do anything to rescue the, the, the city. And in 2016, Johnstown voted two to one for Trump. An old democratic city, two to one for Trump. I now live in Princeton, New Jersey, one of the richer towns in the United States, which voted six to one for Hillary Clinton. So the uh, the Democratic Party abandoned the workers of Johnstown, decided to depend on the educated professional middle class in places like Princeton, and contributed, I think, to its own um, political disaster. And Joe Biden represents an effort to 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 recommit 
the Democratic Party to the working people of America. That was the meaning of Build Back Better. It uh, has a only partial success given the, the 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 state of Congress, where the Democrats either don't have a majority or have a terribly terribly slim majority. Anyway, that's the in my view of uh, I think my tale of two cities tells a, a sociological and political story. It's interesting too that Phil Graham was recently on C-SPAN talking about his book with a couple of economists. And uh, the title of the book was called The Myth of Inequality Propaganda, I think. It seems like we've got these uh, conflicting narratives uh, that that go on. Your third chapter, uh, Liberal Socialists, opens by pointing out that the word liberal uh, is indeed a strong adjective, constraining not only populists who hold office, but also the leftist politicians when in power. You bring up FDR's 1937 court packing scheme as um, a kind of lightweight, illiberal machination relative to his decision to forcibly intern Japanese Americans in California during World War II. The Civil Liberties Act that President Reagan signed into law in 1988 issued a formal apology and gave surviving members, Japanese members, of course, uh, $20,000 each, 40 years after the internment camps were closed. Uh, John Tashishi, who was in the camp as a small child, has written two books in the last few years. One is about life in the camps, and another is about the campaign for reparations. In an NPR interview in 2020, he was asked about reparations for slavery to Black Americans and said this, I know that this kind of thing is never just about money, because money often doesn't resolve the problem. It goes much deeper than that. It's the whole issue of racism in America. Until there are efforts made to try to resolve the root causes and to get at the racism, it's going to be a tough battle to move forward. I have no idea how to resolve something so profound, but we have to try. It can't just stagnate there and fester like a wound. Tana Coates has made the case in The Atlantic, and Thomas Piketty, in his latest book, the Future of Equality, devoted an entire chapter to uh, the question of reparations, writing, no matter how complex this question is, it cannot be evaded forever. It is time to act unless we want deep and lasting injustice to continue. Uh, the subject of reparations seems a non-starter on a number of levels, but there is a precedent for redress. And historically, even former slave owners have been compensated for their uh, loss of property, human property, I should say. I realize there are no easy answers here, uh, but your counsel on this matter, Professor, informed over a lifetime, both religious and secular, as well as a keen sense of political systems. How do you think about the question of reparations? Well, there are now in several American cities uh, movements to organize some kind of reparations uh, for um, Black Americans. They are, I think, politically quite remarkable because I would have thought that this was um, a non-starter in uh, American American politics. I mean personal reparations, gifts of money to particular people um, from the tax base. If I were in these cities, I think I'd probably be part of these uh, these um, movements. Nationally, I am. I really believe that overcoming racism is a question that has to be dealt with at the level of employment and housing, very critically in in ways that that shape the the social structure within which black people and white people live today. Um, I think the most effective reparations and the ones that might be actually politically possible are reparations that 
that transform the character of inner city schools, that transfer the, um, the, the way Americans are housed, that uh, transfer the transform the the job market those kinds of efforts i think would 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 really be reparative that is to say they would repair the um the conditions of the 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 reality of racism in in the united states and and those kinds of measures it seems to me are politically possible Whereas I, I would like to believe differently, but, um, but I don't think on a, on a national level, a politician advocating personal reparations, reparations, gifts of money to particular people would command much of a, of a following. But the attack on structural racism, that is a possible politics. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you're right about that. And you mentioned that uh, constitutional limits uh, and the fact that these limits are are questioned legally and politically, these disputes uh, are settled over time by, as you say, complex processes, which uh, uh, make it difficult to overturn any existing rights or liberties. I want to use your observation there for connecting points you make in other chapters. So I want to segue from chapter two, liberal Democrats, to one of your opening points in chapter seven, uh, liberal professors and intellectuals, where you bring up the struggles of um, professors struggling at multiple campuses without security or tenure. I bring this up in part because of the irony you note uh, regarding the importance of educating citizens in a democracy, and also because I recently spoke with just uh, such an adjunct. Uh, He has noted, among other challenges, that it took him about 10 years to write his first book. I'm referring to Professor Robert Ovitz, who splits his teaching time between the California state and UC systems and just published his third book, We the Elite, Why the U.S. Constitution Serves the Few. In it, he argues it is so hard to initiate change on important issues in the United States, not only because minority interests have historically stymied proposed legislation, but also to what amounts to a federal constitution that is effectively not amendable, uh, noting it has been changed just 27 times over 230 years, and not a single change in the last 30 years, including uh, the Equal Rights Amendment for Women, which is still not ratified. I don't expect you to have read his book, but the title uh, gives one a good idea about the thesis, which shares some overlap with the work of historians like Charles Beard in terms of challenging the American creed and the founder's aura and intent. It's the intersection of interest, though, that I thought you uh, might be keen to comment on in broader terms, uh, because you have some interesting observations on the Trump nationalists of 2020, uh, linked by a class history and a Populist politics, as you put it in chapter four, liberal nationalists and internationalists. Yes, um, again, a large, a large question, and I should begin by saying um, I, I, we have indeed created an academic proletariat, and uh, not to the benefit of either the young graduate students and young um, professors or people wanting to be professors, and also not to the benefit of the, of their students. This is a, a, a typical American struggle, so that we now have um, unionization movements on many, many campuses, recently successful at um, University of California and its branches. And unionization is the right way to struggle against um, proletarianization. So th- this is a um, an American story, uh, and one that I hope will um, bring um, new activism and new um, new participatory politics to our campuses. I certainly agree. The Constitution makes political struggle very difficult for the left and much, much easier for the right. 
that's the character of the Constitution. You could argue that that's what it was intended. Some of the amendments have helped a little bit, but um, still, that is the Constitution we have and political struggles right now. The, your author is right to say the Constitution is not amendable. So political struggles right now have to be fought within the structure that we have. And there is some evidence that um, we can we can win partial victories. The civil rights movement was a partial victory. Uh, the movement for gay rights has been a partial victory. Feminism has had significant victories within this constitution that poses only obstacles for victories of this sort, and yet there have been victories. Uh, what is the great dilemma, the great problem for the American left is that the victories for, for Black people, the partial, incomplete victories for Black people, for gay people, for women, have been accompanied by rising inequality. So you have egalitarian successes in a society that has become more unequal. And that has to be the, uh, the subject of left speculation and left activism. How did that happen? What is the connection between the partial victories and the growing inequality? I think that is, the for the left right now, the central political question. Thanks for that. That's important. Your chapter, Liberal Communitarians, uh, is important um, because of what it means for a participatory democracy, among other things. And you start with an explanation of communitarianism as, and I quote, the close connection of a group of people who share a strong commitment to a religion, culture, or a politics. Their goal is a promotion of the quality of their communal life. Can you give listeners a feel for the focus of your discussion of communitarianism and the tension it presents for your more uh, pluralistic approach to the liberal community? Yes, I um, I am uh, have been called a communitarian, and I wanted to stress that I am, if, if I am a communitarian, I am very much a liberal communitarian. And the best way of explaining that is to describe two versions of communitarianism. And one of them is the civil republic, as described by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, um, in which the citizens are endlessly active. They do everything for themselves. Rousseau believed that there shouldn't be a professional army, there shouldn't be professional politicians, there shouldn't be professional teachers, and certainly not professional police. Um, all of these activities should be the activities of citizens working in various ways of rotation and shared shared participation. It is a, a, a picture that seems to me to be exhausting and um, too warm. I, I am not a civil Republican. I believe in a, a liberal democratic framework within which there can be many communities. That is a liberal framework is one that makes possible the intense communal ties that that people form of different sorts religious and ethnic and professional and and political there has to be room for many communities and that's the kind of communitarian i am i believe in the the value of close intense relations of the sort that i i don't always have but but believe i should have with um fellow academics or um, fellow socialists or fellow Jews. Um, I think citizenship has to be a somewhat cooler relationship, a little more distance, where there is room for representative democracy rather than direct democracy, where there is room for uh, professional teachers rather than elderly citizens, as Rousseau suggests, taking over the classroom, and where there is room for professional police, much, much better than what we have, but professional, um, rather than having the citizens police each other uh, through neighborhood committees of the sort that have sometimes been described in abolitionist literature. So that's what I mean by liberal communitarian, let there be many communities, and let there be a framework which, which allows 
the the particular intensities of each one of them. Well, your book has so much to draw on, and the narrative itself, I think, lends itself to to any kind of really a multiple levels of classroom use. I think um, people who have um, added spark, and and I say that uh, because I I feel that's uh, you do not usually go unnoticed or unappreciated in a liberal democratic republic. A partisanship usually stops uh, at the line of national interests as well it should. Um, consider this. Uh, President Biden has asked you to lead a presidential commission on reframing our nation's purpose, values, history, and meaning. And in effect, the mission impossible. His aides have confided to you that this is really about formulating policy to come to terms with America's current polarization. Uh, given uh, recent history and campaigns for social change, you find yourself in, in this scenario determined to avoid what seems to be uh, the longer term in... Yes. The ineffectiveness of those groups. Uh, if I were a member of such a commission, I'm not sure um, governments or countries have a national purpose like a political party does or a social movement. Um, the national purpose of the American uh, state should be to sustain, to realize, and then sustain uh, the the democracy that um, and the equality that was the promise of our founding. And um, I believe that requires perennial struggle. And I think the groups like Black Lives Matter um, are an essential part of that uh, of that struggle. Uh, often activists in those parties uh, drift toward a kind of absolutist or sectarian politics, which is ineffective in American uh, history. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't need groups like that and we don't need groups like that to have internal dissidents who res who resist absolutism and who work to create um, social movements that can draw broad, broad support. Those are the, um, the social movements that I hope to join, support, and that I hope will always be qualified by the adjective liberal. Well put, Michael. A nice way to close. Those interested in broadening both their understanding of politics and political theory and the crucial distinction between what liberal and or illiberal mean as adjectives from the perspective of a life lived steeped in the actual politics then and now would do well to pick up Michael Walzer's The Struggle for a Decent Politics on liberal as an adjective published in 2023 by Yale University Press. Let me also call attention to the Blackstone audiobook, professionally read by Robert Fass, who really brings Michael's far-ranging political thoughts and narrative to life. Michael Walzer, political theorist, pluralist, and guiding light to so many, appreciate you making the time for this. Okay, thanks for doing this.